Welcome to Professor Game Podcast, where we interview successful practitioners of games, gamification, and game thinking, who bring us the best of their experiences to get ideas, insights, and inspiration that help us in the process of getting the students to learn what we teach. And I'm Rob Alvarez. I teach and work at IE Business School in Madrid, where we create interactive and engaging learning materials. Want to know more? Go to professorgame.com slash subscribe, start on our email list, and ask me anything. So engagers, welcome to Professor Game Podcast once again, because today we have Jasper. But before we get started, Jasper, are you prepared to ignite, to engage, to go on with our listeners? Yes, definitely. <laughs> Let's do this, because Jasper... Your, Jesper or Jesper? I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Uh, it's Jesper, but I also respond to Jesper. <laughs> Jesper. So Jesper Ewell is a pioneering video game researcher and occasional game developer as well. He has a background in both literature and programming, and he has dedicated his life to taking video games seriously as a culture and art form. He has also published four books on MIT Press and taught at MIT, NYU, and is currently teaching at the Royal Danish Academy of Fine Arts at the School of Design in Denmark. Is there anything else that we, you would like to include in that intro, Jesper? Uh, I think that's good. That's good. <laughs> that's great, because today we are with Jesper because of all of those reasons that you saw there. But Jesper, we want to get to know you just a little bit more, more a bit more personally to, to get in touch with, <laughs> with you and I'd like to know what does, you know, being Jesper in a day like today, what does what your schedule look like? What are you doing these days? Uh, well, I'm, I'm in academia, so that's what I say these days. Uh, and, and I'm also the head of a master program called Visual Game and Media Design here at uh, the Royal Danish Academy of Fine Arts School of Design. And so, so what my day is like is basically I, I face this constant onslaught of things that kind of are asking for my attention. And so I, I realized to kind of get any research done, I've ended up dividing the day into two. So I do my research in the morning before I check any emails or or social media, um, and research can then be any kind of thing, right? So I can can be reading or writing or even playing games or, or sometimes making games, right? And then uh, around lunch, I, I kind of switch. I switch to that world. I own my email uh, program. I switch to that world of kind of organizing and hiring teachers and developing curricula and supervising students and so on. So I, I, I figured out, I realized that's the kind of way I can kind of make it work for me. I've I've heard about what you're saying that I've heard it many times recently that you know getting your output so what you're going to deliver you're you're going to when you're going to write when you're going to create things it's better to do it before you get any any input especially from social media and email because it's like you're you're not in control of those things yeah. you're, you're, you can't sort of manage them it's just what comes at you and and you make sure that you, what you have to do your your output what you have to create is something that you get done first in the morning. I've been trying to do this many times. <laughs> My schedule is not always amenable to that, but I do think it's a very, very good strategy, and I love it. So thanks for that, Jesper. And of course, we always like to get into the subject as well. After understanding what are the kinds of things that you do in your day, we would also like to know of a time when you were creating something. You know, we were either creating a game, you were doing some of your research related to games as well. One of those things, and you set out to do something, and you would not probably call it a success. In fact, you'd maybe call it a fail or a first attempt in learning. Is there any favorites in that sense somewhere where you learned a lot or you were able to get out of it in some way that we can, we, as well as, as usual, what we want to do here is learn from what your experience looked like and, and see what we can apply as well to our lives? Yeah, definitely. So uh, a little more than 10 years ago, uh, this was just after uh, like Bejeweled had been really popular. Uh, so now we talk about games like kind of Candy Crush. So with some kind of colleagues, I was making a kind of casual game, sort of like a matching tile game in that style. Uh, and we had this like long process. So we, we were working remotely. We, we really loved what we were doing. And then we were spending all this time testing the game on, on a kind of friends and family. And, and we kind of really felt we'd kind of hit just the kind of the right spot. It was like the right amount of feedback and it was like somewhat innovative and it had the kind of right difficulty curve. Uh, and then when we finally released the game, it, it just kind of quickly realized that actually we kind of hit somewhat wrong, right? Because all the people who were reviewing the game and, and writing about it on sites were actually kind of really, really, really deep 
into these kind of matching tile games. So we actually made a game that was just way too easy for them. And, huh. and that was a kind of <laughs> that was this kind of sobering sobering moment, right? We we did we really felt we'd kind of done our research and and kind of did a good done a good process, right? And and so what I what what kind of came after that for me was, was two things. Like one was I wanted to understand this whole field of of kind of casual games a lot better, and and that actually led to my my second book, the one called The Casual Revolution, because. I felt it was kind of interesting that a lot of people who were playing these games were kind of really, really dedicated to them, right? Whereas there was a kind of stereotype that anybody who was playing, I guess with today say like a mobile puzzle game, that, that these were people who weren't really kind of engaged and weren't taking it seriously and just became clear that wasn't true. So I kind of ended up kind of writing my second book, A Casual Revolution, on, on the heels of, of that kind of disappointment. I just wanted to kind of understand <laughs> like wh- what was going on, really. And and also, in, and also in a way, my, my third book, The Art of Failure, uh, also kind of in a way came a bit on the heels of that because I, I wanted to like understand why it was so frustrating for people when they didn't fail in a game, right? So in a way, we still have this kind of intuition that we kind of dislike failing in a way, right? But it, it became very clear that people were really kind of angry if they never failed in a game, if it was too easy. And so you'd say that there was a kind of my personal failure here <laughs> led to in part <laughs> to those two books because I just felt that there's just something I just didn't understand, right? And I wanted to get into it. So talk about comebacks. That's a fantastic comeback from, <laughs> from that situation. And um, I know you wrote a couple of books on the heels of this, but is there any sort of key lessons that like if you were you were facing that once again you were thinking of creating a game like that or or any other game would you say that there is something that you would do you know from the onset completely different or you know a key lesson that you took from that yeah sure i mean so so one was uh, not to get led astray by kind of stereotypes about your audience or what you heard about your audience so it's kind of very clear that we had some assumptions about what the audience was like, also based what about what people were, were saying at the time, like uh, even designers and in various talks. And we were kind of let us self let, be led astray by that, right? And so we weren't reaching out to the right channels, like we should have found like some kind of some internet fora at the time and it recruited some, some playtesters there. That would have just have given us like much, much better input, right? And so, and then the second one also is just that I think probably we should have thought about making a team that perhaps like included more people who were like super fans of these games. I kind of like these games, but I don't think I'm, I'm not like a super fan of, of kind of puzzle games. And I think we should have to kind of tried to expand the team more with, with people just like really, really into it. Uh, so I think that that's a kind of mistake. And, and I think perhaps this is a kind of common mistake, right? Like not really figuring out what your audience is or, or, or setting up a testing procedure where you end up reaching out to people who aren't quite your audience. And so, so I think, think these are kind of common mistakes that everybody can make. Uh, we certainly made them. Absolutely. In fact, you were, you were talking about, you know, friends and family and, and close relatives and so on. I think they could be a first screening. They can be very useful as a first screening. Yeah. I don't know if you'll agree with me, but then you have to take that next step as well and start approaching as closely as possible, those people that would actually be players that you would you would have. Maybe, you know, friends and family will, will just tell you about the broad things that they see and that you don't want to get a, a more final user to see. But, but you know, want to make sure you see how those interactions go with real users with fantastic lesson. I'm, I'm, mm. I'm sure you took from that. Yeah. So taking a, a spin on this, of course, we, we talk about failure. You have a book on failure, a different kind of failure, of course, more related to how video, in, in, to, to games and video games. But uh, we would like to, to take a spin on that and say something that you went actually to go for, and it was a success. You know, this challenge that you, you went for and you're using games, your research on games, and you actually succeeded using that. And again, we want to draw some lessons, say, well, these are a couple of things that I would attribute that success to. Um, sure. Or a part uh, of it, at least. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think perhaps uh, to think about this in a, in a kind of very general way, um, I think about my kind of own research process. So I think that you say my, my approach is probably generally that I'm a kind of humanities person. And, and what does that actually mean? It means I, I care about why people find things meaningful, right? So, so to me, that's always been the interesting part. Like, what is it about? kind of video games or various kinds of video games that kind of people can find meaningful. And I think perhaps at least when, from my own perspective, when I'm successful 
in my writing or in my research, it's also because I'm as willing to to kind of look at it rather broadly, right? There are certain things I was trained in, like typically literature, right? But I'm also kind of willing to think kind of pretty broadly about, hey, how does meaning occur? Or like how, what's actually going on in a, a given situation? Or what is it that I don't know? And so I do feel like in some way, at least from my own perspective, <laughs> whenever I write a book, <laughs> uh, I, I'm kind of a new writer. Perhaps, you know, this kind of thing from the outside, perhaps from the outside, it all, all seems the same. It's possible, right? But but so, for example, like in my most recent book, uh, Handmade Pixels, one of the things I ended up writing about was uh, what's, uh, what's, his, what's her name? Uh, Kurt Helkett calls uh, conspicuous production. So in a way, it's this idea that today, if you go to a coffee shop, or at least back when we could go to coffee shops, right? So there, there was a there's often a kind of emphasis on, on on this idea of the source sourcing of whatever you're drinking, right? For example, so there's you can buy this coffee that's like single origin, and and this is very comes from a very specific point and place in the world, or or you could can or you could go to restaurants where which would specify in kind of great detail like what where every ingredient came from, right? So so this there's this pot I don't know if you know there's this Portlandia episode where they go to a restaurant and. I want to want to hear about where the chicken was raised, that, that how it grew up, and all this kind of stuff. So I think this is a definitely the kind of thing. What, what school they went to as well, right? Yeah, exactly. So so this <laughs> definitely the, yeah yeah, but this is definitely I think a thing in culture, right? This uh, idea yeah. of 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 that something becomes kind of authentic or real or valuable because you know where it's from or, or who made it, or this idea of like the artisanal gin or artisanal chocolate or, or whatever. And it just I thought it was really interesting for me when I was think about independent games to see that, well, actually that those were the kind of things that were popping up in independent games. So, so a lot of independent games have this, this story about how, how the game was made. It has the story. Somebody had this kind of burning passion and they dropped out of the university or and lived on, on noodles for a very long time. Or there's a Danish game that has a story about how w- once they graduated, they actually slept at the university illegally for many months just to be able to make that game, right? So, so, <laughs> so, so that's I think that's become a kind of common trope, right? So hear this story about how the game game was made, right? And I think you can also see it in in the visuals of a lot of independent games that often, in a way, try to go away from kind of quote unquote like photorealistic kind of three D graphics and do things that that are looks at a kind of hand drawn or or handmade in some way, right? So so it becomes a way also to use the graphics to kind of give this feeling that this is actually a game that comes from somewhere, that somebody actually made because they kind of really kind of felt like it. And, and I think to to me, perhaps that's that's also been interesting, like over the years to to be able to think about the different kind of sources of, of meaning that people find. Like, why do people find like this kind of hand-drawn game valuable? Well, of course, it ties into some other cultural things that are going on at the time. And so I think perhaps, at least in my my own mind, like when I'm <laughs> when when I'm I'm successful in my in my research, it's also because I'm, I'm kind of willing to to think about it in different ways and and not just to say like think about the ways I was I was trained when I when I was studying myself. Absolutely, absolutely, it sounds super interesting, and I would say definitely that was a, a big success, and we. We can get to talk a bit more uh, about your book, but before we do that, I'd like to know if you have some sort of, again, when you're, when you're, maybe you said you're an occasional game developer, um, maybe when you're creating games, maybe when you're creating, maybe it could even be about research. So when you, when you think about these things, do you have, well, research is in general tends to be, have a lot of method involved and, and it's a bit standardized, but is there any sort of process that you follow when you're, when you're doing your thing, when you're creating these games or or figuring out new ideas of, of what to research, like h- how do you do this? We would like to get sort of in your mind for. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm still kind of influenced by what several people uh, wrote about, like Tracy Fullerton or, or like uh, Robin Hunick. This idea of designing for a kind of experience, right? Because I think it's still very easy when you when you're making games to to just start with a genre or start with a game type or even start with what the tool wants you to do, right? So, so clearly both kind of Unreal and, and Unity, they kind of want you to make kind of 3D shooters or at the very least. They, <laughs> they want you to make games involving like a, a character 
uh, walking in, in a 3D world, right? And I, I think um, I always think this idea of like designing for experience instead, like starting with, with that experience. Like what's, what is this game supposed to do? Like what's the experience the player is supposed to have? And start with that, then work your way backwards. I, I still think that's that's kind of really really important, and, and it can also do so be when when I'm kind of supervising students. So, for example, uh, last year we had this collaboration where uh, we had 20 students from Parsons School of Design in New York came here in Copenhagen, and then we worked with the National Gallery to look at at ways to engage the audience in a different way, right? And I, I think here it was it was kind of important to be open to and also talk to the students about that even though we probably came to this situation with a kind of game approach or thinking about games, that that could mean like any number of different things, right? It didn't have to be something that had points. It didn't have to be kind of gamified in, in any in a particular way that, that you could just think of games as, as a just kind of much broader field, right? Something that can sometimes be about kind of points, about structure, and that has something that this does very well. But sometimes it's it's about something else, right? Sometimes it might be about like taking on a, a kind of particular role or kind of role playing. So so some of the students, for example, <laughs> did this project, which was much more about actually kind of picking up a card. But oh, let me explain actually. So so the, the National Gallery is this kind of arts museum, right? And so we went there and we looked at how how patrons were approaching the museum, and it was just kind of clear. That, that some people know how know what to do when they go to an art museum, and some people really don't. Right? They're, they're, they're really unsure what to do when when they come in, and they actually really would like you to help them, right? And then what what some of the students did was this thing, which was actually more about a kind of role playing exercise, where you got a mask and a card, and then you had to like kind of do something. You had to like approach certain artworks in a particular way and look at them as some artworks in one way or go somewhere else and think about it in a specific way. And I thought that was super interesting because it's not a it's not a game in its traditional points like sense, right? But it takes that kind of role playing element for, from games and, and helps uh, people like kind of see things in, in artwork even if they're not used to it. So I think to me that's that's kind of super interesting, right? And then that, and then sometimes you do need to do something that's kind of super kind of point driven and so on. But just this idea that to remember also that, that games can be kind of many, many, many different things. It doesn't have to be like like this one structure that is just really broad, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And um, I think it's Jane McGonigal who said or, or mentioned that somebody else said probably um, the games are a, a series of, uh, you know, unnecessary obstacles that you, yeah. you go through with a set of rules that you know, you could just get into the museum and do your thing, but you're you're agreeing, you're getting into this loser attitude and getting into this through the game lens. And I love that. I, I I completely agree that games can be so many things, and that looks like a very very neat experience that you created. They are. I, I would probably be one of the users. I, I would, <laughs> I'm not very good at getting into art galleries. It's funny. My oh, yeah. mom is a she studied in a design academy in London and back home as well. I'm from Venezuela. Uh, she she's all artsy. She loves paint. She lo- like knows every everything about art history as well. I have like no clue. I get into a museum and I'm like you know like lost. I know I would enjoy more of the experience if if I knew more about it, but then I have to research and I often don't have time for that. So I, I'm guessing that some some experience like that would be very very neat. I would be probably one of those users of of, <laughs> of that experience. So that sounds fantastic. But it's also kind of interesting, I think, that that I think some people need, you might call like an alibi, right? So so to to engage with art in a certain way, right? And so then if you oh, assign yeah. like a role or a structure or the same things you have to find, like in a museum, then that, that kind of gives you a bit of a, that, that takes away some of that pressure towards figuring out how you're supposed to kind of stand <laughs> and, and look and, and so on. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Jesper? Is, you know, when, when we're thinking about, you know, creating games, when we're thinking about making games that have a certain purpose, you know, that the purpose of that game is probably to make people feel comfortable in a museum and have, you know, something to do, a national art museum. When you're thinking about creating these experiences and these things, is there any recommendation, any best practice that you could say, well, if you're going to get into this, into this field, into this thing, considering this, doing this, thinking about this would definitely help you get something better or would absolutely make it rock your world yeah i mean so so the 
Yeah, I mean, so I mentioned it a bit, right? So, so I do think again this idea of of, of designing for for the experience, like starting with well, what's what's the experience that the player is supposed to have, either like emotionally or cognitively or whatever, and that that is the very first kind of thing you ask. And then the second thing you ask might be like, why would people play, right? And um, I think this is something that that's just it's, it can be subtle in a lot of ways, and sometimes it has to do with say like the artwork or something that. That it has to be whatever you're making has to be something that when people look at it, they actually want to engage with it, and, and that's super subtle. And sometimes you need to test it a million times, right? But then I think it's just it's just very easy, especially if you're trying to do something that's not kind of purely entertaining. That just to think about all the good you've done in the world, and not to think about just that kind of I might say onboarding experience where where people pick up stuff like in the very beginning. And also, I think if you want to kind of go even broader, there's this um, Sabrina Kuliba, uh, who used to be at, at Shell Games, has published this thing called the Transformational Framework. I don't know if you're, if you're aware of this. So, no, I haven't so, heard it. So, so I use this with students. It's just a, it's a really, really good document that just goes over like all the things you need to think about when you're doing like a game or game-like experience that has to make some kind of change in the world. Right? You specify, well... Well, who, like, say, who are the stakeholders? Who are the experts? What do people need to, what is the change you want to make in people? Like, so is it emotionally or is it like in terms of kind of opinions? So is it in terms of knowledge or actions? How do you want to evaluate it? And all these kind of things. So it's this really, really good checklist for, for all of these things that you might forget <laughs> if you're, if, if you're, <laughs> if you're making kind of a game that has to have a purpose other than, than entertainment. And I, I just found that. Just we started using it uh, like this spring, and it's really, really useful for for students, right? and I think for everybody else, uh, as it's just this kind of list of all these kind of things that you might forget. Hmm. hmm. I'll, I'll I'll look that up and probably put it in the show notes as well, so that the engagers can find it right there. And Jesper, that is, I think, it is a fantastic recommendation. Something that like most people can just access and do that. And I would like also to have a recommendation from you, like listening to these questions to. Now you know a bit more about the audience as well. Is there somebody that you would like to listen to, like another guest like yourself, that you would like to listen to in an episode like this one in, in Professor Game? Uh, yeah, I'd recommend uh, Mary Flanagan, uh, who's at uh, Dartmouth. She's also an academic and, and a kind of game developer and, and artist uh, sort of slash activist. So, so she's done uh, things which are both kind of art installations and, and, and kind of political games. And she's also written about like the history of well, <laughs> the use of, of games in, in, in art. And I think she has a lot of, uh, she has a very good kind of range, both kind of theoretically and in terms of the things she develops and also in terms of thinking about things like kind of assessment of, of if you're trying to make a game that makes a difference, like how do you know that it actually works? So I think I would definitely recommend her. She sounds absolutely fantastic. And the, the, one of the nice things as well is I had never heard about her. So I love those kinds of recommendations as well. And Sitting right next to your four books, Jasper, what would be a book that you would recommend to the audience and why? Yeah, so so this is a this is sort of like a, a book by Brian Sutton Smith called uh, The Ambiguity of Play from I think 1997. And I think this is also perhaps ties into like my own own way of thinking or or <laughs> or, or if you think of something like play or games. I think you often have these moments where, where I think you figured it out. And then I think that usually leads to a moment where you realize you kind of haven't quite figured it out. And, and The Ambiguity of Play is a book that kind of Brian Sutton Smith wrote at, at the kind of end of his, his career, where, where he's a play theorist from New Zealand. And he just writes about like all the different ways that people have talked about play and talks both about that. You can think of play as a play with identity or play as kind of waste of time or or play also as a kind of assertion of power. And and I think it's just, a, you can say in a way, it's a, it's a book that presents different kind of frames for thinking about games uh, and, and play. So it's not something that teaches you like, this is how you will make a game, but it's just something I think that opens a lot to thinking about that games and play can actually be all kinds of different things. And that if we're going around talking about games and, and play in a certain way, it's probably just because we're just parroting like one particular historical idea of play. And I think it's just really, really healthy to, to be aware of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. It sounds absolutely fantastic. And 
I asked you to talk about this book, but I would also like to know what is your latest book about? What is what inspired you to, to go into handmade pixels? You kind of got into it a little bit of, with, with the whole indie games and games with meaning. Is there, is there something else that you would like to mention about your, your, your latest book, which is handmade pixels? Yeah. So, so as is, in a way, as I was alluding to my, my books often come from something that I, I feel I don't understand or that's kind of strange in the world. And, and I think what was happening in the last, especially 10, 15 years was that there were all these new games coming out uh, called, and that people call independent games. And people were just uh, both kind of really adamant that this was really important. And it was clear that something was happening. You had new kind of festivals and like independent game festival or, or Indicate. But people were also really disagreeing about what they kind of really were. They, they, they were often very different games. And then what I, I said, I just simply sat down also with an assistant and just did the work of looking at how <laughs> all of those festivals had, had kind of, awarded games from roughly like 1999 to, to 2018 for, for 20 years. And to, to also say that, well, it was interesting to me to think of figure out like where, where, where did independent games come from like, or what was it, right? And so, so then it became kind of clear that it was an idea that people really started talking about around like 1999. And that was kind of funny, right? Because obviously people had been making small games back in the 1980s and so on. But then we, when I sort of kind of came back and looked over the history, then it became clear that people in the 1980s, they would never use a word like independent for themselves. That what they, were just, they were just making video games in any way they could. And if it had a small budget, it was just because they didn't have any more money, right? And, and then it's interesting, then, around, <laughs> then it's around 1999, you start having this other idea that independent games is something that reacts to a bigger industry. Of course, it's because the the video game industry has become so consolidated that this felt like you could do something that felt alternative in some way, right? And then I write about, like, then it takes a while for people to figure out what that is, right? You start having independent game festivals. <laughs> and then in the beginning, people are just making small versions or demos of regular AAA games. So it, it takes around, like, five or six years before people actually start making something that actually looks different from what the big budget games of the day. And I just thought it was kind of super interesting. It's just super interesting to kind of go back and, and look at that at that kind of history and then to see that, okay, today I think we probably have a kind of shift where I, I talked about, in a way, three different kinds of independence, right? One is what we talk about usually like financial independence, this idea that you're making it on your own dime or whatever. And then I talk about what that if aesthetic independence, that you're making a game that actually feels or looks different than, than other games or, or than mainstream games. And then the final kind of phase is uh, what I talk about as kind of cultural independence. Like when, when you make a game where, you, <laughs> where, where you're claiming that it has a, a kind of a broader value, right? It, it could be kind of political. It could also be other things that here's a game that's, that's actually making some kind of difference, right? So I think a recent game is a game called uh, NeoCab, where, where you are kind of a, 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 an Uber driver somewhat sometime in the, in the near future but where you're just about to be replaced by like uh, autonomous vehicles, right? And it's just about being in that position, right? And I thought that was it's kind of interesting game. It kind of comments on all kinds of kind of things about kind of precarious work and, and the gig economy and so on. So so that's an example of a game that's, that's for example, kind of culturally independent. And, and so to me, that's just interesting to, as a way of opening up, like why are people disagreeing about independence all the time? And then, well, clearly it's also just because it's not just one thing, right? It's, it's several competing ideas and it's something that hasn't been around like all the time, right? It's, a, it's something that kind of really gelled around 2005 and, and 2006. And then I think to me, that's then interesting to see how that, that kind of plays out now, how, how some say like how console manufacturers uh, sometimes don't care about indies. And then whenever there's a new console, it seems that they care a lot about indies. So indies become a, independent games becomes a way for say Sony to fill up the store for when the PlayStation 5 comes out, right? So then it just becomes a kind of something that, that the big manufacturers use to kind of fill up the new consoles, right? And just it's sort of interesting, I think, to kind of trace that history. And then also to, of course, to think about how does it relate to kind of music or, or independent music or independent cinema, as, as I think people often ask me about. And so so one of the funny things that happens is that, like in, in especially in music, you often have this idea that there are major labels and then there are indie labels, right? And, and, and then there's a discussion, wh which ones count, right? But then 
you can see that for the independent game festival from the beginning until 2007 2008 the criteria for entering the festival is that you have to be unrelated to certain kind of financial entities or labels or publishers and then in 2008 it becomes that you have to just tick a box saying that your game was made in indie spirit <laughs> well the things have changed that that's that's part of life i guess and and the, you could call it an evolution. Some people like it more, some people will like it less. And it, it is, as you say, it kind of is what it is, right? Yeah, but and I think there was also, I think, that, that independent games, that, that you had some independent games that became really financially successful. And then it just, it also, you would say, that's also a kind of funny switch here. Then in, independence become a, becomes a state of mind, right? It becomes a spiritual thing, almost rather than a financial thing. And, and I think even later, I think that's a, perhaps a discussion in the community of, that, that they don't want to define independent games. It's just something that, that say, like the jury of a festival decides from year to year what feels kind of kind of independent, right? And, it's, and you can also say that there's a shift from kind of independence as being like the auteur or the kind of romantic artist making a game of, uh, by themselves to now you have much more of an idea of the games are made by kind of groups or, or kind of communities. And I think, what does that mean? Well, what it means is also just that I think everybody loves to, to, loves the word independence. It has this kind of really cool kind of ring to it. But also that this is not just one thing you can sprinkle on anything, right? So when people started start making independent games in the early 2000s, what happens is just that there's all these cultural ideas from that particular time that goes into independent games, right? It's not just a copy of independent music from the 1980s. It's actually something else, right? Absolutely. And, and to me, that's just also just interesting. That, and then you can think about how does that go all the way down to, to say how people use Unity or, or make their own kind of flash engines or whatever, right? So to think about that, like how do very small design or even technical design decisions actually connect to very large cultural trends? It is. It is very interesting and definitely a, a very good reason as well to go and grab patented pixels. <laughs> yeah. So, Jesper... What would you say when, when creating games, when, when researching games, what would you say is your, is your superpower, your sweet spot, that thing that you do great? And I, I think you've given us some clues as well. <laughs> what would you say is that thing? Yeah, I would say to, to the extent that I have a superpower, I, I can delay making up my mind for a very long time. So, so uh, also say both when I'm kind of researching or making things, I can, can I can take a very long, I, I'm, I'm fine with waiting a very, very long time before I kind of commit to any, say, like, way of structuring a book or any kind of gameplay or anything like that. So, so I'd say that's, that's the thing I'm best at. <laughs> of course, it, it works better if, if nobody's waiting for me, of course. But uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, but, but I, think, I think that's that. Also, I'm, I'm, I'm not so wedded, I think, to one way of looking at games or, or writing, and I'm not so wedded to kind of one kind of game structure. I'm, I'm kind of fairly agnostic in, in, in many ways. I, I hope you, that... You are independent. Yes, definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely, and that is a superpower for sure. And I know from you know the research that you do, uh, you've also talked a little bit about this that you've probably played quite a few games. And this question yeah. might come in in an interesting sense as well, because we would like to know what is in your case, and according, of course, to your likes, what would you say is your favorite game? Oh, well, it's it's such a it's a very hard question. I ask students this all the time, and then they ask me back, and I say <laughs> that's a, such a hard question. It's unfair. Right, so so it's a bit of a you say it's somewhat contextual. So like uh, when I when I play with my my, I, I see also the world a bit through my kids, right? So things like Minecraft and and Fortnite and and the games of Tokaboka are, are in a way I think the the most kind of amazing things in, in the world. I definitely see this this kind of through their their eyes. But then I think for for myself, there, there's some games that I've really enjoyed. I really enjoyed like the first Red Dead Redemption. I also had like other kind of games like Super Monkey Ball. I, I was really attached to that kind of series for a long time or, or Choo Choo Rocket, <laughs> like an old puzzle game. So, so uh, yeah, so, so I think those would all be like kind of favorites. And so then there's a difference between what, what I play like for myself in a break and, and what I play, say, like with, with kind of kids. Uh, I, I must admit, like right now, I'm, I'm realistically playing Clash Royale more than anything, but I'm not actually enjoying it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so, so, so literally I had this period of time where, where I, would, I would delete and, and reinstall it like several times a day 
because I also uh, <laughs> love hate relationship. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but it's also this kind of thing. I, I've become so far in that game that that in a way the game is asking me for a level of engagement that I can't really give. Right. So so I'm not. So if I, I can't I can't if I if I play just like if I'm not really playing full attention paying full attention when I play I'm gonna lose right and and sometimes well yeah. I have kids and other stuff going on so I'm 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 also being pushed out from the game to some extent to where I am to your to your life and that's that's okay that's good yeah. as well so Jesper we're running out of time but of course we want to make sure that we know where we can find you where we can find your books where we can you know if it's on social media to maybe make you further questions by by the engagers. Where can we find you in the world of the internet? Yeah, so uh, my own web page is called yeah, jesperjewel.net, where well, I, I list all my, my books, obviously, and then I have lots of my kind of papers and publications can be read there. I also have a blog uh, on that side where I write about kind of games and, and write about kind of say, w what's going on, uh, new journal articles and that kind of thing. And then uh, perhaps like a kind of more so for the kind of shorter term or more direct contact i can be reached on, on twitter at at uh, jesperjewel.net and so at jesperjewel yeah absolutely absolutely so again if you have any final words for for the engagers any final piece of advice that would be great before before we take off yeah i think just that that just remember that that games can be many different things you don't have to make any one kind of game and also perhaps one thing i'd always recommend is to kind of ask people or, or perhaps if you're in a group like everybody Should, should kind of write down what kind of game they just don't get. They cannot understand why anybody would ever play it. And then you have to commit to actually play that game for yourself <laughs> and actually kind of come back like next week and tell everybody why why that game is really good. So, so it's just ah. a way to, to, as an exercise, to kind of get out of your own habits and, and get out of your own comfort zone. I think that's really, really important all the time. Interesting. I really enjoy that. I think I'm going to use it with my students at some point. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jesper, for, for being with us today, for investing this time in, in, in this conversation with the engagers, providing so much value, so much insights that you've, you've gotten through, through these years and all this research. However, at least for now and for today, it is time to say that it's game over. Engagers, thank you. Thank you for listening to Professor Game Podcast. And I may ask you a question. Can you let us know how are you listening to this podcast? If you're doing it through a podcasting app, have you already subscribed and rated this podcast? If you haven't, please go ahead and do so because that is the way in which we can reach more engagers like you to achieve this mission of making learning amazing, making learning fun and engaging. If you need instructions, just go to professorgame.com slash iTunes. And of course, before you go on to your next mission, you know, just set it, subscribe, hit that subscribe button and listen to the next episode of Professor Game. See you there.